I will talk about the social consequences of the confinement. And the first um, aspect one needs to point out is that there is very little data on the effects of COVID-19 on uh, the social structure on our societies, but also on the labor market outside the US. And that is important to know because we cannot really show you a lot of empirical data of what is going on because there is just very few empirical data. And the data you can see is uh, the data we, we see very often if we watch the news these days. And this is about the US jobless claims so, uh, and how they have surged in April. You see that uh, in the beginning of the year, jobless, jobless claims per week were less than about 200,000 a week. But from um, late March onwards, they, uh, they surged up to 3 million and then uh, up to 7 million a, a week. And we now have uh, more than 25 million uh, new job, uh, jobless claims in the US, which is uh, gigantic and which is um, unprecedented in that uh, short period of time. In Europe, we know uh, uh, very little about what is happening to the labor market because most labor agencies have not published their data. What we do know is some uh, data on a short time working and the latest data for France is that there, so far there have been more than 800,000 companies uh, claiming short time working claims. And it is estimated that these cover about 10 million workers and so far more than 4.3 billion hours are not worked. In Germany, the, uh, the numbers are lower. We assume that so far 700,000 firms have, have made claims of uh, Kurzarbeit, the German word for short time working for March. And it is estimated that these cover about 4 million workers. But this estimate is really very rough. We have no idea whether it is correct and it could, this number could be much higher. The reason why we do not know anything about the German labor market, for instance, is that the labor agency only uh, publishes data for the previous months at the end of this month. So they will publish data at the end of April next week, but this uh, data will only cover the situation of March. So we only, at the moment, we only really know what has happened to the German labor market until the end of February. And this was really the period before the pandemic started to hit. So we just don't know. We, ha we do not know how unemployment has uh, developed over time in Germany until now. The only, the only real data we know is about the 700,000 new claims of uh, short time working in March. And that, by the way, is uh, about 10 times the number of new claims for, uh, for short time work in the financial crisis. So if we compare this crisis to the financial crisis, we know that the claims for short time work is 10 times as many. And that gives you a little bit the extent of the crisis during the financial crisis in Germany about 1.5 million workers were on short time work. If we say there are 10 times as many claims from companies, there might be 10 times as many uh, workers who are affected that would go up to 15 million workers affected. We do not know whether it's true because today we talk about different sectors than 10 years ago. But what uh, I just want to highlight here, the situation is likely to be uh, much worse than during the financial crisis. I want to give you some data of what we know about who is hit hardest from various sources. And this is a, based on a policy brief by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which looked at who is affected by the lockdown for the British labor market. <clears throat> and what you can see here is a, a uh, figure which looks at the share of employees in uh, shutdown sectors. And this is by gender and by age. And what you can uh, see there is that the young, that young workers are much more affected by, the, by shutdown sectors because young people are much more likely to work in services, in restaurants, in areas uh, which cannot be uh, open at the moment. And in particular women, if you look at the group of the under 25s, you see the women and the men and men are affected about 25% of all men under the age of 25 work in uh, shutdown sectors. But if you look at the women, it's about 35%. So a third of all women under 35 uh, under 25 are affected by the lockdown. So the young are much harder affected by the, uh, the, the, the lockdown and therefore also the loss of their jobs. If um, this uh, data is, uh, this figure is also by, uh, based on the policy brief by the Institute for Fiscal Studies and it shows and it looks at the wages and there you see a similar picture. 
it is that, uh, and it shows that um, the lowest paid people are much harder affected by the lockdown compared to more highly paid people. And that is intuitively also quite reasonable because we know that in the restaurant sector, in the service economy, wages are low and low paid people are also young people. So it makes sense to, to look at, to assume that it is the low paid, the young people who will lose their jobs or have lost uh, their jobs in the lockdown, during the lockdown. When we look at essential services, I uh, show you some data for Germany, and this is about wages in essential services. So who works in the essential services? It is predominantly women, but it is all, these are also mainly jobs that are relatively low paid or at least lower paid than the average of, uh, of the German worker. If you look at this graph, and in the next slide, you can see the graph a little bit better. If you look at the gray bar at the top, this is the, uh, is the uh, hourly wage for all jobs, the average uh, wage for all workers in Germany. If you look at the orange bar, this is the average wage, the hourly wage of all uh, workers in essential services. And below that, there is a number of different jobs and occupations in essential services, and that ranges from administrative to, to jobs and cleaning jobs but also then uh, health jobs. And if you look at the bars with the highest wages, these are either IT people or they are, they are doctors in essential services. And, uh, uh, but both areas, IT and, uh, but also medical services are jobs where you have a higher share of men compared to women. So you, in essential services, you do have more women working and that is what you can see on the next slide. You see that there's an high, the, the green dots, which you can see on that slide, is the share of women in these services. So in most of these occupations, you have a high share of women. But if you then look at the comparatively, the pay for men and women, you see that there is a gender pay gap in all these occupations. And you have a high share of women, but these uh, women are relatively low paid in a sector and in most sectors, which are lower paid than on average anyway. So what I want to say is that, you know, in these days, we have a lot of people working in essential services who cannot stay at home and cannot uh, work in their home offices, who run a higher risk of being affected, a higher health risk, but most of these people are either female workers and most of these people are also on average worse paid than the uh, than workers or employees in the economy as a whole. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, <clears throat> it is really just indicative to, to show, you know, that the, the impact of the crisis on those people who work, who, are, you know, first who have lost their jobs in the lockdown were the young and women. Now, if we look at essential services, we find again a higher proportion of women, but these women are worse paid than men in jobs which are on average worse paid than the average worker in the economy. That is what I want to say. You know, the, the, if we look at who is actually hit hardest, it is people, it is predominantly women and it is predominantly people who are in jobs who, who are worse paid. And this is um, another, uh, this is based on survey data. <clears throat> so the other ones were based on administrative data. This is a survey which has been carried on quite recently and uh, it's an online service and asks people, you know, how have you been affected by uh, the shutdown? And it asks people whether they work uh, still in their work sites or in home offices. And this is a comparison uh, and it, it, this is a, a presentation which is based on income groups. And what you can see is in the second row, the second row are the people who are in their home offices. And this is uh, either below 1,000 euros of income, between 1,000 and 2,500 euros of income, and above 2,500 euros of income. What you can see is that the majority of people who, uh, are in, who work in their home offices um, are highly paid people. So have an income, a net income of above uh, 2,500 euros. And that shows that there's a division of, you know, what kind of people can you do from home? What kind of, uh, what kind of jobs can you do from home? And what kind of jobs uh, do you have to do in the work sites? This is highly stratified and highly stratified by, by earnings, but it is also stratified by education and that is based on the same uh, survey and it asks the same question and uh, uh, looks at it, you know, on the basis of education. 
and it's uh, the the bars are the low low school education mid mid level school education or or tertiary education and again you can see that those people who can work in home offices are people who are who have tertiary education and that makes perfectly sense if you think back you know these are the highly paid people are also the highly educated people and on in in contrast those people who are lowly educated and uh, who have low paid these are the people who have to work either in their work sites so they have to go to their offices or they are not working at all at the moment so this is the, the, the data I showed you a moment ago, which is based on an online survey of workers and it, and it asks these workers, how have you been affected by the crisis? Where do you work? Do you still work in your workspace? Do you work at home? Are you in your home office? Or do you have other work arrangements? And what you can see, and this is divided by income, you can see that those people who work in home offices are people who earn more than 2,500 euros per month. You know, there's a clear in income effect on the fa uh, on your work situation, whether you can work in, at home in home offices or whether you have to work at your workplace. So that was one um, graph I showed, and this is the graph which shows you the same information based on education, and it divides the people into low education, mid-level education, and uh, tertiary education. Again, you see the same uh, effect that those people who are able to work at home are people with tertiary education or high uh, qualifications. And that makes perfectly sense if you uh, contrast that with, P with the income slide before. It is those people who have high incomes, who have high education, who can work at home. And this is almost 50% uh, so almost half of the people who are in home office. Uh, and in contrast, you can see who has hit hardest, who has to go to work are the people who are low skilled and low paid. So the other people who are hit hardest are people who, about who we know very little. And I'm not aware of any study who really shows how children are affected and how women are affected. And the only way to, to uh, look at that is, is really if we look at the, the current public debates about it. But in most countries where the lockdown has, uh, has taken place, uh, children have lost their school education. They have not been able to go to school anymore. They have not been able to um, attend their childcare facilities anymore. In many places, they have not been able to go to go to playgrounds anymore or to use uh, uh, sports facilities. And in many cases, also digital learning, which is provided by school, virtual learning uh, has not really taken place because many schools were not really prepared uh, to carry out and deliver any kind of digital learning. Um, I can tell you from, from the German situation, it has taken the German public, but also the German government about four weeks to realize that children are actually negatively affected by this. The first four weeks when after the schools were shut, there was very little debate about what does that actually mean for children. There was some debate, what does it mean for working mothers, because working mothers in their home office had to juggle both the children and, and also their work. And, you know, they, you had of family dynamics in that but what it actually means for children not to be able to go to school anymore <clears throat> not to attend their kita their their childcare facilities anymore and not to really be taught anymore because schools do not have the facilities for digital learning about this we know very little and in germany this debate is now about two weeks old that the government actually pays attention to this and focuses it on it when it uh, when they talk in the in the corona cabinet that is the decision making within the German government that they actually focus on the effects that this will have on children because by now we know we have many reports uh, from education uh, from teachers but from other experts in education who say you know it will obviously be the children of the most disadvantaged families who will lo lose out when they can get, uh, cannot go to school anymore when it comes to uh, women, there is an issue of domestic violence. There, again, we have very scarce uh, data on this. We have now data coming from uh, police reports, <clears throat> which show that, uh, the, the, that domestic violence has been going up. There have been more emergency calls on uh, domestic violence and the number changes between uh, additional 10% but also additional 30%. We are, so we're not quite uh, sure about the extent of the problem, but we know that there is a problem. So children and women are hit hardest also when it comes to uh, their social surroundings. 
And then there is a group of workers, uh, again, about who we know very little. We know a little bit about the self-employed because they have been in the center of uh, attention when it came to the bailout package or the rescue package because self-employed, a lot of self-employed lost their entire income immediately. And there have been uh, grants and uh, cash transfers to some groups of the self-employed but uh, we do not really know how much in income they have lost. And the two groups of, uh, about who we know li literally nothing are the groups of posted workers. And uh, Germany is, as well as France, a country where we have a lot of uh, posted workers as um, it's a destination uh, country for posted workers. They have lost their income immediately. They only had income protection in their country of origin. We know that in most of these countries where postal workers come from, there is very little in terms of social protection and income protection. And the same is true for seasonal workers. There's very little protection for seasonal workers, and it is now a health and safety issue, which is now uh, gradually coming into attention of the government that they have to uh, provide better protections for, for seasonal workers because in Germany, as in many other countries of Northern Europe, there's a need for seasonal workers in the agricultural sector. And there have been um, organized flights and trips from Southern Eastern Europe, in particular Romania and Bulgaria, coming into Germany about 40,000 seasonal workers who have been flown into the country at the time where all the borders were more or less shut. And now the question is, how can we protect seasonal workers from being affected and what will happen to them if they actually uh, catch the virus? But the information about seasonal workers is very scarce. So these are the people um, who are hit the hardest in, in our societies uh, by the virus. And the, the question is, uh, who is actually protected and how have governments responded to that and delivered some protection? And what we can see is that there have been big relief packages, as, uh, and this is as a percentage of GDP. Germany is the country in the OECD with the highest relief package of about 18% of GDP. But France is also, has also a very uh, big relief package. The same is true for the UK and uh, for, to a lesser extent for the US. And then what you can also see in this graph is that the relief packages are much bigger than the relief packages in the bailout, uh, bailout packages in the financial crisis. The GFS is the great global financial crisis. Um, and what we see when, when we look at the delivery of the relief packages and the protection packages, that they are highly stratified in the same way as the welfare system works. So you see market differences between the more conservative welfare states, and that is in particular Germany and France, compared to the more liberal welfare states in the UK and the US and the Nordic welfare states. And there's a big discussion about uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, the different responses in the Nordic welfare states, in, in particular in Sweden. But I think what uh, we can see in both Sweden and Denmark and uh, the other two Nordic countries is that the, the welfare of children and the attention which is paid to education and childcare facilities it's, is much stronger compared to both Germany and France, the conservative welfare states on the one hand and the liberal welfare states in um, the UK and the US on the other hand. So just as a final example, on uh, and that is about the the most important policy tools that almost all countries have now developed or adopted and this is short time working and that is what i started out with at the beginning so in france we now have um, a million companies applying for short time work and in germany it's it's about 800,000 short term work is a policy tool it's a very traditional policy tool in germany which has been uh, greatly modified and adopted during the great uh, global financial crisis and um, after the global financial crisis a lot of european countries have looked at short term working as a tool because the, the analysis was this helped uh, germany a lot during the financial crisis and helped them to overcome the crisis very quickly and in the aftermath, many countries have adopted very similar uh, policies. And France, uh, as you know, has also now a partial reduction of activity schemes, so also a partial working scheme. And uh, but also, and that is the most surprising um, observation of all, is that both the UK and the United States have adopted similar schemes. In the UK, you can earn uh, up to 80%, uh, up to a, a threshold of 2,500 uh, British pounds. 
as a uh, pay compensation if you are furloughed or if, you, if your uh, hours have been cut. Um, it is not quite clear how this, um, uh, how this policy is working because the government is now building up a website of how, you know, which companies can then use uh, to, comp to ask for compensation um, for these payments. In the United States, um, the Paycheck Pro Protection Program um, has been a very big program and it uh, consisted of 350 billion uh, US dollars and it covered 100% of earnings up to a pay of 100,000 US dollars a year. So this was a very generous scheme at, on, you know, on paper. Uh, but what we know about uh, the implementation of this program is that it has been very patchy. All the money has, has been spent in a very short period of time. Um, they spent all these 350 billion uh, US dollars but it did not necessarily get to those people who needed it the most, but it mainly, although it was a program targeted at small and medium-sized companies, we know that it was big companies who got this money and there has been a lot of um, <coughs> segregation between big and small companies, but also um, between different groups. So the, U the US uh, pay pay Paycheck Protection Program is a prog program which did not protect very much uh, and and that explains the big surge in uh, uh, unemployment claims which we have seen in the US. This has also to do with another fact also uh, very specific to the United States that their uh, unemployment benefits were topped up by an additional $600 per week and this was regardless of what you earned before so that for many workers in particular low paid workers it was actually more attractive and more beneficial uh, to claim unemployment benefits because they could be higher than their initial earnings. So there was a lot of uh, fragmentation and also uh, not very good coordination between these programs. And it is actually for many people better to be unemployed at the moment in the US than uh, compared to be on a paycheck protection scheme. What I wanted to show is um, <clears throat> that there is a trade-off between the sort of generosity between these payments, but also the sustainability of these payments. And Germany, which is the country which has this policy for the longest period of time, starts out with a 60% of uh, wage compensation, which is relatively low, which is at the level of unemployment benefits, but has a, a time perspective, which is longer. It is initially for 12 months, but it can be extended to up to 24 months, which is actually a, a very long time perspective if we consider you know, that this crisis should go on for another 20 months or so. On the other hand, we have uh, some programs, in particular the American one, where you have 100% of earnings uh, covered, but these programs have a very short time perspective. And this trade-off, you know, if you look at it, who will be protected, who uh, won't be protected, you will see that it is the core workers in the German case, for instance, who are much better protected for a longer period of time compared to uh, more fringe workers or more uh, uh, part-time workers and pa workers which a, uh, not call, who are not permanent workers, whereas in other countries it is much more unclear what will happen what, uh, after these two months will run out or the initial three months run out or what will happen in France after June the 30th. We just don't know. So it is essential what we know from the German case is that this money has to be de delivered fast, but it also has to be targeted that it gets to the right people. The entitlement must be clear, but also you have to trust the system. And that is uh, in the American case very often not the case that people actually do not trust the system. So uh, finally, what about the future? <clears throat> what we can expect to see over the next um, six or 12 months, depending on how long this, this will uh, continue. I think one effect that uh, most people um, who study labor markets and, and uh, uh, welfare states is that we expect further polarization of the labor market so that the young will lose out, not just now initially, but also in the medium and long term, because they will have a, an entry in the labor market, which is much more insecure. We might also see more discrimination against older workers, that companies will use the crisis now to weed out older workers because they're seen as less productive. Uh, productive. 
What we have already seen in the last four weeks is uh, that there's a clear discrimination of women on the labor market, uh, partly because they are already treated in a in a worse way compared to men because they work in essential services where they do not earn as much, but also because they're affected by the lockdown services. But also in general, if you see at how decision making um, uh, decision making has developed over the last couple of weeks, even in the country where people say it's, it is working relatively well, women have been excluded uh, from many decision making processes and uh, they, you know, there's a constant battle now about bringing women back onto the decision making table because they have to do with, you know, they're busy with childcare, they're busy in their home offices and uh, they're not really at the table when it comes to decision making. And finally, the most vulnerable groups on the labor market, and these are migrant uh, workers, these are seasonal workers, these are posted workers, they will probably lose out uh, also in the medium term. What should we do in the future? I think there need, the, the attention needs to shift. So far, you know, there has been an, a, an initial response trying to protect the jobs of those people who were already in work. And this was the core of the programs when it comes to short time working. I think the attention has to be broadened now and it has to shift to protect children to take into account the rights of children, but also the needs of children. And that has to do with schooling, childcare. It has to do with sports, but also with playgrounds. Children have to get out. They have to uh, move and they have to play. And there needs to be new programs to uh, uh, ensure that children can actually go outside, that they, they can do sports and they can be schooled either in a digital way, in a virtual way or on site in schools. And uh, this discussion, at least in my country, is now only beginning how, how can we do that in the long run. There must be uh, much more attention to women and to the protection of women. And that has to do with rising domestic violence. And uh, again, there has been very little uh, discussion about this and nothing, literally nothing has been done about it. There has to be a shift uh, towards digitalization. I think it is clear that when it comes to the labor market, to home offices, to many occupations, that digitalization will play a much bigger role in the future. But digitalization will also now play a big role in education. And we, we see that in tertiary education, we see that in university teaching now, we all teach online now, but it definitely has to take place in school education and we need concepts and we need tools and we need, need to be much better prepared when it comes to digital tools in uh, school education. And finally, and that is my, my final point here, we need to uh, talk about income protection, not only for those, for the core workers who are usually protected, but we also need much better income protection for the poor and for the low paid and income protection for the self-employed, which is still not secure and for many cases will still not last for more than the next one or two months. So we need better protection scheme, schemes when it comes to income protection for the poor. And that is it from my side and I hand over to Bruno. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Okay. It's very interesting if you can unshare so that yeah. Bruno can share. Will do. Okay, all yours, Bruno. Okay, thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is uh, to take a, a more uh, broader view, less um, empirically grounded and trying to understand what is at stake here. And uh, the main point is that what we see now is just an amplification of uh, mechanisms that have been observed uh, before. And uh, if we want uh, some of the things we are currently seeing uh, to be changed, perhaps we want to understand the uh, mechanisms uh, at stake. So basically uh, what we see now is a very polarized situation between those who are at home, those who lost their job and those who have to go on the labor market. And it's as if there was a kind of a replication of what we know from the, the work uh, done on the polarization of the labor market, uh, which is also a polarization of protection. But I will end by asking uh, whether uh, what we see currently and the importance of uh, some jobs for all of us uh, should change our view on what is called usually in the literature, the low skilled jobs. So the first thing I would like to, so this is what I wanted to say is that uh, what we see currently has been uh, shown uh, already in this kind of books 
uh, we have shown uh, now a decade ago uh, that those who are uh, uh, the outsiders are women, those kid use migrants, which is again those who are suffering the most from the lockdown. Uh, so I will not reiterate what uh, Anke has shown uh, so far. So basically what is uh, at stake here is the transformation that has uh, going on for the last 30 years in the labor market, where you see that this is uh, US data uh, drawn by uh, auto. Uh, what you see is that uh, you have on the one hand a sharp increase um, uh, of highly paid work, especially in the 70s and the, in the 80s. This is on the right hand uh, of the graph, but you also see an increase in the uh, low paid, uh, supposedly low skilled jobs. Uh, and you see that more and more in the US, but it's not only in the US, you see this kind of polarization of jobs all over Europe. This is data from Camille Penny that we published in a special issue. And what you see here again, if you look at, at your right, uh, right hand side, you see an increase in well paid job. You see a decrease in the mid skilled mid paid jobs, either clerks or industrial. And what you see on the left hand uh, is more or less creation of low-skilled, low-paid uh, jobs, supposedly low-skilled, low-paid jobs. This is the graph that has been uh, applied for France by Catherine Tesmar and Landier. They've shown the same thing from the uh, 90s to the uh, 2012. You have a sharp increase in uh, well-paid jobs on the right-hand side. You have a decrease in the middle and you have an increase in the uh, low-paid jobs. So this is a uh, a global situation that we know. So what we call job polarization is that you have many more well-paid jobs for the skilled ones and many more jobs in the interpersonal services, low paid, atypical in terms of a job contract, bad working condition, badly paid jobs, because they are not only uh, uh, supposedly low skilled, they are also uh, working in an in a atypical situation, relatively bad working condition as documented, for instance, by uh, Camille Penny in this paper. These are the, the, the list of the jobs uh, that have been increasing in France and decreasing in France on the low uh, paycheck. And what you see, the first line here uh, of the jobs which have been created, uh, 487,000 are nannies, childminder, domestic helps. Then you have people working in IT, you have administration, you have nurses, care workers, uh, self-service employees, carers, um, and, and this kind of jobs. And then you have and many female work have been created in the low pay uh, sector. And the vanishing op occupation is much more in the manufacturing industry. So today there is a strong polarization between those being protected, as uh, Anke already said, who are at home, who are teleworking, uh, and they are usually highly paid they are the ones that we've seen in my graphs of the polarization uh, on the right hand side. And many of those who have to go on the front line, who have to go working, uh, they are on the left hand side of my graphs, of the polarization graphs, you know, low paid, uh, badly paid. As uh, a lot of people say today in French, is les premiers de cordé, you know, the, the ones who are supposed to be on the top, they are teleworking, tandis que les premiers de corvée are on the field, on the front line, to put it in French. How do we know that? Uh, there has been some projection by OFC about who is likely to be teleworking. And you see here that it's mostly the white collars here, uh, the uh, intermediary profession, the uh, uh, skilled employee. This is uh, clearer here, uh, still OFCE. You see 50% of those who are uh, susceptible of teleworking are uh, white collar, cadre, cadre in French, and uh, intellectual profession, uh, as we are doing uh, now, uh, intermediary profession and skilled workers. So they are uh, teleworking. And on the other hand, many of those who are at work, who are on the front line, are those having these low paid precarious jobs uh, that have been on the rise over the last 30 years. In health, of course, but also in care, the cashier in supermarkets, the, the persons in charge with securities, logistics, transportation, uh, delivery. Uh, if we refer to uh, the most recently published ILO monitor on the COVID uh, crisis, what they say is that um, uh, many of those uh, uh, still working, especially health workers, are on the front line fighting the virus and making sure that people have their basic needs met, including workers in transportation, agriculture, essential public services. Globally, 
a global uh, scale, there are 136 million workers in human health and social work activities, including nurses, doctors, and other health workers in residential, residential care facilities, social workers, support workers, laundry cleaning staff who face serious risk of contagion and contracting COVID. 70% of these jobs are in the sector held by women. So these jobs are uh, uh, once again associated with slow pay, bogus self-employment, sometimes short-term contracts, part-time work, low social protection. The literature on the polarization of the labor market does not question the fact that these jobs are bad jobs because they are supposed to be occupied by low-skilled people. They are supposed not to be productive. That's the statement that you very commonly read in the labor market economist literature. Just to quote one, you know, the one that I've uh, mentioned to the report by uh, Catherine Tesman Landier about um, the, the labor market uh, in France, polarization in France. What they say is the profound polarization of the labor market has led to a sharp rise in wage inequality. Low skilled jobs in personal services, catering, logistic health, those who are on the front line these days are by nature and I do underline by nature, tasks in which productivity is low. Those who have had to move into such jobs are paid less than what was usual in the skilled manual and clerical jobs that they held before. Conversely, managerial and creative occupation have seen their productivity increased by the possibility of IT and the remuneration of such jobs have increased relative to the median wage. So, I call that a new world, the world of the uh, service knowledge-based economy, where you have on the one hand, on the right hand side of the slides, the brains, you know, those who have human capital, who are highly paid, supposedly highly productive, but they rely on what we could uh, call their servants. And there is a kind of so new social cleavage between the so-called productive people who, with very high wage and the non-productive people whose jobs are concentrated in the activities of servicing the other one, services to people, uh, interpersonal services. And uh, this uh, polarization is uh, increased by homogamy uh, more and more. Uh, people of the same kind of uh, group uh, get together and a new form of uh, social domination of brains and servants is in place. Uh, this relationship of uh, domination is least seated on the ownership of the means of production than on the position of human capital knowledge and creativity. Of course, it's clear that these new servants, of course, in their uh, quotes, enable the brains to concentrate on their task, not wasting time to subaltern task and thus increase their productivity. And what we see today is that these servants are, are absolutely key for the whole functioning of our economies and even to save our lives. But these low paid jobs are necessary and they are necessary condition for the increased productivity of the other ones. But their necessity and their contribution to uh, the overall productivity is not paid, is not uh, remunerated. So I, I, I hope that while the current crisis and the decision taken uh, 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 are increasing these divides, as uh, Anke showed, we can hope that the lockdown has revealed the collective utility, the importance of the essential jobs occupied by indispensable persons who may receive better protection, remuneration, and place in our societies in the future. As our President Emmanuel Macron said, il nous faudra nous rappeler que notre pays aujourd'hui tient tout entier, so hold entirely on women and men, that our economies acknowledge and pay so badly. But I don't want to stop there because one of the questions, if we want this to change, is to ask why are these servicing uh, sectors, the people working in this, uh, so badly paid? And I, will, I would like to finish on that. First of all, of course, it's because these are tasks, of course. I mean, that's the social uh, uh, situation. These are tasks performed by, mostly by women. The task of reproduction, as feminist work has shown, previously unpaid work at home. And when they ate uh, the, the labor market, it was perceived as a uh, less important job, if you wish. Then there has been a theory saying that these services are not susceptible of productivity gains. This is the Beaumont cost disease. So basically these kind of services have been seen as way too costly on the labor market. So there has been accumulation of action and policies aimed at cheapening their cost. And these action and policies are first outsourcing 
first firms in the 80s trying to get rid of all these kind of jobs so that they could make some bids and uh, get these jobs done for a much cheaper price from the outside. Then uh, creation of these jobs have been uh, favored by liberalization policies of the labor market so that the pay becomes cheaper, there is less protection, therefore less cost. And there has been also, especially in Germany and France, specific fiscal and social contribution exemptions uh, to those employing these services rather than to those providing them directly in order to reduce this cost. Finally, it's very explicit in Germany since the early 2000s and has become the same in France later on, it's a competitiveness strategy. The idea is to create a cheap environment for the protective, productive ones, the German and the French uh, economy competitiveness strategy. Basically, the idea is that if the hairdresser, the cleaning lady, the nanny is not expensive, then there will be a general wage moderation, which is good to competitiveness. Of course, all these policies have contributed to keep these uh, interpersonal services as cheap as possible. So it was the aim to have this sector to be as cheap as possible, of course, without considering the working and living condition of those occupying these jobs, but also without considering the infrastructural necessity utility of these jobs. And we see that now, they save and protect lives, they care for others, they allow, and they allow all of us to function, work and live. And I hope that instead of calling them the low skilled, we will now call them the essentials and the indispensable. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Bruno. So we have like 15 minutes for addressing a few questions. So as many of them, I've, I've, I've highlighted some of them that I can start ask. But if Bruno or Anker, there are questions I don't ask you that have been asked that you'd like to, to address, feel free. Um, maybe to bounce back on Bruno's presentation, an interesting question was, is the job polarization amplified by the crisis or just made more visible? And another personal question, remark I would add to that. Could we expect, um, the deglobalization that might be accelerated following the, the, the crisis to actually reduce the polarization. So the, the first point, I'm, I'm not sure what, what is clear is that it, it is much more visible. I see uh, Hilary Silver saying in a comment that there is nothing new here. Yes, uh, probably for those who have been working on the labor market for uh, 20 years, but it is much more visible now to everybody. There has been tons of uh, newspaper articles saying, you know, what is going on with these people uh, who are going on the front line and they are very uh, badly paid. So I think the polarization becomes much more visible than it was before. Whether it is amplified, it's very likely in a way because um, all those teleworking uh, will see no change in their protection neither on their pay, whereas uh, many of those who have um, uh, lost their jobs or have uh, only a partial uh, situation who get unemployed, uh, they will have a much uh, more lasting effects uh, of the crisis. So there might be an amplification uh, of the division. Whether the, the de-globalization uh, uh, will have this impact, I would say it's only if uh, uh, we stop considering that there are two main sectors in our economy, what is called usually uh, the exposed sector, which is the one exporting, and the sheltered sector. And this kind of denomination again reproduce the idea that the exposed one are the productive one, the important one for which we need to make some effort, and the sheltered one are the protected one because they are not subjected to international known competition. Whereas we need to better um, see the intertwinedness of these two kind of sectors to be sure that they will reduce the polarization, I would say. Thank you. Uh, a question for Anke, can you draw some preliminary comparative analysis of Eastern versus Western parts of Germany based on, on what we know on the impact of the confinement? Is that a relevant differentiation? Is there anything you see that can be said? Um, <clears throat> can I first add to something that, uh, that Bruno said about polarization? Sure. Because I think sure. that is the, 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 the key theme really. Um, um, so will polarization, it, it, 
you know, is there anything new now or is that, is that a, a process which we have been seeing for the last 15 or 20 years and it's just more visible? I think um, when we look at polarization, this has um, to do with the wiping out of the middle and the wiping out of the middle is uh, a occupationals that certain job occupational professions which were mid-level uh, qualification professions do not exist anymore and the best uh, example in, in the data you showed Bruno were the secretaries that you know that the biggest decline was among the secretaries and that is a classic mid-level skilled jobs which has disappeared and that has a lot to do with technology and a lot of these uh, structural changes are driven by technology so they have nothing to do with the with the crisis at the moment and um, but what we uh, expecting to see is really that the crisis now will drive further processes of digitalization in a much more in a much faster way than before so what what will happen when the sort of the, the lockdown finishes and we sort of come back when the economy uh, starts working again is i think that uh, many sort of uh, projects and processes and uh, introduction of digitalization in many areas will speed up at in a in a much faster pace as we have seen it before and that will drive much more a structural change based on technology and that will further wipe out the middle ground and so the, the the process of polarization is a process of the last 15 and 20 years so this is not new but the speed is new and the speed will be, become faster and therefore it will also be much harder to uh, counteract the process of polarization because we will see a big restructuring, big transformation in, in many areas and in, and also in, in, you know, at least in Germany, also particularly in the manufacturing areas where, where this process had already begun, but now we have a big, bigger push towards it and we will see much more of it. I think that is one way of sort of, um, of looking at it. Um, with regard to East and West Germany, we do not have any numbers. So, the, you know, what we do know is that um, the service economy is much harder hit compared to the manufacturing sectors. Manufacturing has been in lockdown, but to uh, a lesser degree and I think that is something outside Germany not so well understood that they you know there are there are still sort of production sites that are uh, carrying on and they because in manufacturing and especially those uh, areas which are highly automated where you can actually continue to to um, to to produce um, manufactured goods but uh, the 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 service economy is is the ones which is hardest hit and eastern germany is full of service sector jobs much more there are much many more service sector jobs in east germany compared to west germany comparatively speaking so it must be hit harder but we do not know we don't have the figures we don't have the data thank you um one question that that's probably for for either of you uh, there's been several questions about and and you've You've given some partial answers. What do we know about how the extra workload due to the absence of schooling has been split within households? And more difficult and important question, do we think that the effects of the confinement will be persistent and will affect intra-household chores allocation uh, in a persistent fashion? <clears throat> well, again, there are only some um, some online service surveys that ask people, you know, how do you cope with home office work? How do you cope with childcare, etc.? And these online surveys show, you know, a traditional division of labor. And you know, as these are conservative countries, at least Germany is a very conservative country women perform much more of the household chores, they perform much more of childcare activities, and they continue to, to do that. And in confinement, this will be exaggerated and it will be stronger than it was before. Um, to the question, will this um, um, persist? I think it will persist, uh, you know, if we don't uh, recognize this very consciously, and if we do not address it very consciously, there is a big danger that these uh, uh, old division of labor between men and women will persist uh, after the crisis. What we, where we can see it already without having um, real empirical data, just anecdotal data, is for instance, when we look at short-time working, 
we see that mothers with young children opt uh, to go on short time working because it makes it easier for them to combine some working and, and their childcare duties. But what that means is that this will have a lasting impact on their ability to go back to full-time work afterwards. And we know that this will have a scarring effect that if you reduce your hours uh, uh, over a longer period of time and to a, to a higher percentage compared to your male colleagues, you know, you will end up in lower positions. So we know that the labor market works that way and it's highly likely that this will persist after the crisis. Thank you very much. I know you want to add something on that one. Oh, um, perhaps uh, uh, on other points. Uh, I think that uh, Anko was complete. Okay. There are a number of interesting macroeconomic questions that, that I can summarize in two ways. First, do we, what's your, it's a difficult one, what's your pronostic on the sustainability of the packages that seem to have been the most efficient or desirable to date? Uh, in terms of, of, you know, public finances, monetary and fiscal policy, that does it appear sustainable to you or are you extremely worried on that dimension? And second, is it already clear, it's a related question, whether the shock from COVID uh, will have a longer impact than the shock of the 2008 crisis? On one hand, the shock right now seems bigger, on the other hand, it's a purely exogenous shock, whereas the 2008 crisis raised a number of political and social tensions to those, to many extent, to us, and the gems we manufacture by the financial system. So on those two questions, how long the shock will be, are the best, most efficient answers sustainable? I'd like to have your inputs. If I, if I may, so I think both questions require to look at the EU uh, as a whole, at least for, for European countries. And, and uh, uh, as far as uh, sustainability and, and uh, solutions are concerned, uh, it, it depends a lot on uh, the capacities to uh, mutualize the answer uh, in order to make it uh, sustainable. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that uh, instead of comparing the two crises, we have to realize that they are accumulating for many countries. You know, the second crisis comes after the first one. Uh, and this, um, you know, add up uh, to the difficulties that uh, countries have had, especially Southern European and Eastern European countries. Uh, the third point I'm used to make, especially when I speak to, with Anker, is that uh, the risk is uh, uh, that we retrieve the situation of 2010, 2011, where there has been a split between the north and the south of Europe. And we see that risk currently going on. You remember the data that uh, Anker has shown, Germany is putting more effort now, but it has more uh, macroeconomic possibilities for that with a lower debt uh, before that, um, uh, uh, higher level of saving, uh, and, the risk, and also uh, a less uh, death toll, for instance. Uh, as far as we know so far, uh, Germany is doing better in terms of death uh, and consequences of the, of the COVID. So the very risk is that again, when we will be speaking about the sustainability of the situation, whether we, we can afford a uh, welfare state, whether we can uh, find solutions together, we end up in a divided Europe between North and South, unable uh, to, to share and mutualize. And my bet is that uh, uh, the history will not repeat twice exactly in the same way. I mean, here, that's uh, Southern Europe, uh, might not agree a second time to be forced to cut in hospital beds, for instance, to cut in welfare state programs. And this might lead uh, to a political question and not only a macroeconomic question, which is the situation in Europe uh, after a few months of uh, this uh, split between the North and the South. <clears throat> yeah, just two points on that. I, I think, um, I, I literally, I, I think we do not know because we do not know how this crisis will unfold. We do not, I mean, we all know that, you know, all countries will come out of this crisis with much higher public debt levels uh, than before. Um, but we, we also know that countries have different abilities to carry higher debt levels um, than before. You know, for some countries, it, it really is not a big deal. For other countries, it is a very big deal. We know that the Eurozone plays a big part. We know that this has already led to um, 
to conflicts within uh, the EU about bailout packages and about increasing debt. So, so this scenario we all know, and Bruno has just said, you know, it, it, is, it looks like a very similar situation than 10 years ago. We can't really, it would be difficult to imagine that we get the same outcomes as 10 years ago. So uh, I think that is um, on, on the public debt. But um, we also don't know how the, the crisis will unfold because it really, at the moment, we have sort of frozen economies. We have frozen companies. We have frozen labor markets. We have tried, the, what governments have tried to do is to preserve jobs by subsidizing wages to companies if they do not uh, lay off these workers, if, if workers don't become unemployed. That was the, the standard response in, in Europe, at least. And as I said, you know, the US tried the same, but uh, with uh, didn't manage to do it. And but we will not, we do not know what happens when you know when we move out of this. You know, how many jobs will be lost? How high will unemployment actually be? How many companies will go bankrupt? You know, at the moment, there are negotiations between Lufthansa and the German government whether, whether Lufthansa can survive. And you know, Lufthansa has already said that they will uh, get rid of 100 airplanes and they will cut down on their uh, business activities in, in a big scale. And this is uh, going on from many companies. So we do not know how the real economy will be affected, both in terms of jobs, but also in, the, in terms of business models, how the uh, economy will transform into something else. And I said earlier, you know, digitalization will now um, take off at a much higher rate, but we do not know what that means for, for jobs, you know, which jobs will actually survive this, where will they be employed, we know where the need is, we know the need is in social care, in hospitals, in, in many uh, parts of the service economy, in, you know, in the essential services, but we do not know who will pay for it. So I think there's so many um, unanswered, uh, you know, so many open questions for which we do not have an answer. It's very difficult to know, you know, where we will be in a year's time or in two years time or in five years time. Thank you very much. So we have a long established tradition at Sciences Po of finishing seminars more or less on time and I'd like us to keep this tradition in the world after. If Anke or Bruno, there is one question I didn't mention that you'd like to discuss and answer, maybe now is the time. And before we, we conclude, is there anything you'd like to add, either of you? Uh, there, are, there, I've seen a lot of questions about uh, additional explanation for the the fact that uh, these jobs, you know, the the one uh, on the the inter interpersonal services jobs are low paid, and uh, indeed uh, there has been more and more competition around these jobs uh, because they are created, but also there are more and more people. Uh, looking for this kind of job, uh, which explains uh, low wage. There is another one, which is uh, there, are, there are usually very low rate of unionization in these kind of services, which also doesn't favor uh, high jobs. There are, there are a lot of questions around uh, female and male uh, balance of uh, activities at home. We don't know uh, yet, except uh, online uh, surveys. We are not sure that we will see the data on unemployment uh, but I, I just wanted to, to finish on the fact that in France, uh, for long it has been suggested to uh, parents, and uh, it means mothers, uh, to take leave to take care of children during the confinement to deal with their problems. And it's quite interesting that recently it has been decided to shift from this kind of leaves to uh, partial unemployment, uh, because probably it was a uh, way too costly, the demand from women. Uh, to take a leave just to take care of their children. So I think there are uh, many signs of the unbalanced distribution of work uh, at home under the current circumstances. Just as a final, um, final word from me, and I saw all these questions uh, about the gender impact, I think um, you know, there, there is not enough data yet uh, to, to really answer these questions. All the data we have is really um, online surveys and the official data, the administrative data on, you know, changes in unemployment, applications to unemployment uh, will be made available in a couple of weeks time and then we can look at it. But there are also other groups and, and I saw a couple of questions um, <clears throat> on these other groups like, you know, prisoners, for instance, or people, families with children with disabilities, carers in um, old people's home, etc. These are 
there, there are a lot of, of people who are heavily affected by the crisis who are completely uh, not in the public eye and who are not a part of the public discussion about them because as soon as you have several vulnerabilities and accumulated vulnerabilities you will be hard, cut you will be hit very hard by the confinement because your carers will not be there anymore. And um, I think that we need to move the discussion much more towards these people who are the most vulnerable groups in societies because they're not on the agenda at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. So um, it's time to conclude. Let me thank again so much uh, Anke and Bruno for having accepted this very difficult exercise to scratch the surface and very short notice on, on one of the most major, what will be one of the most major questions in social science, no doubt in the, in the weeks, months, years to come. Uh, thanks a lot for, for all the attendees, despite the minor technical glitches in the beginning, we, we've, we've learned I think, reasonably quickly. Uh, it was very interesting. The, um, the webinar has been recorded and will probably be available somewhere soon. Uh, and we'll make the, the slides available as well. So thank you very much, and, and please stay tuned for the next webinars to come. We don't have the whole schedule yet, but we'll be several of them.